chemistry room fragrances is the perfect addition when elevating the vibe of any space whether if it's your home car or office and something needs a quick refresh our room fragrances provide that beautiful burst of fragrance with just one quick mist shop now at www chemistryroomfragrances.com and be sure to follow us on Instagram at chemistry room fragrances. Chemistry room fragrances. Mmm, smells so good. Welcome back. This is your girl, Camille Essex, host of the Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast with innovators and creators connect. Tonight, I have a special guest, my brother and friend. He's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, Middle Tennessee State University, Kevin McKenzie. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So what's been going on? What's been going on your way uh, since we last spoke on my Kim Mimosas? Well, just, you know, uh, been working on school and, uh, you know, working on my, uh, my doctorate. Uh, degree and uh, just trying to you know stay healthy out here in this COVID world. Facts, facts. <laughs> so first of all, I do want to thank all the listeners and viewers, those that may be tuning in right now. Be sure to like, share, comment, hit that notification button, and follow me on YouTube at Camille Essick. Just hit the notification button and on Instagram at Camille.Essick. Before we get started, Kevin, we're going to play a little game. And for those that are viewing at home or listening later, you can drop it in the comments below. Um, it's called This or That. So, Kevin, I'm going to ask you um, a couple of questions and you just tell me which one you prefer. OK. All right. OK. Uh, and just disclaimer. Yes, I, I chose violence tonight. So I just want you to be aware of that. <laughs> All right. OK. So this or that. Tupac or Biggie? Tupac. Why? Uh, Tupac was more of a poet, and uh, I really uh, just felt more of his 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 vibe or, or his words. So it was just it meant more to me uh, when he was speaking. Okay, I feel the same way. I'm a huge uh, Tupac Shakur fan. Um, I loved his writing. Uh, Berkeley, uh, they even had a semester on him that they taught um, after he <laughs> passed away. Um, just on his writings, I thought was really interesting. So. Next question, this or that, <laughs> macaroni and cheese or collard greens? Collard greens, I'll talk. Um, I'm, a, I'm a green connoisseur. So whether it be okay. turning collard greens, it's all me. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, cool. I love collard greens. Uh, growing up, I did eat um, uh, mustard and turnip, but hands down, collard greens is my favorite. Okay, this or that. <laughs> The shimmy or the cane? <laughs> Considering that uh, most of the shimmy, uh, I, I made up a lot of the line dances, I'll say shimmy. Really? Yeah, the shimmy, yeah. Actually, a lot of the line dances I made up before I became a kappa. Okay. So it's interesting. So the shimmy, yeah, I, yeah, it was, yeah, just swift, just shake, you the, know. The choreography, okay. <laughs> this or that, droid or apple? Apple. Okay, no question. Dishes, <laughs> dishes or laundry? Laundry. Why? Uh, laundry, uh, because I like my clothes fresh and so clean, clean. I know that's corny. <laughs> that's, that's the new for you. <laughs> okay. This or that, the toilet paper, over or under? <sighs> over. Okay. All right, this or that, DC or Marvel? Marvel, I'll top. I actually just watched uh, The Eternals. I have not seen that. Yeah, it's on um, it's on Disney Plus. Okay. And me and my son, we go see all of them. Okay, cool. Uh, this or that, <laughs> taking an exam or writing a paper? Writing a paper. I'm not a big exam taker. Same, same, same. I, I can write a paper in my sleep. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> this or that. $3 million cash tax free or three hours with a billionaire. Three hours with a billionaire. Why? The reason because I can learn how to make money and keep my money. Okay, I'll probably take the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In a melee, Jackson or Chattanooga? Chattanooga, all top, all day. <laughs> that time, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, uh, bonus, this or that, peach cobbler or apple pie? Peach cobbler with ice cream. No, we didn't ask about the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stick to the, the, the questions, bro. I'm sorry, peach, peach cobbler. No, we just playing. Okay, cool, cool. So give us a little background. Okay, so clearly you're from Chattanooga, Hamilton County. Uh, what was it like? <laughs> we, we get it. Chat town, we got you. All day. <laughs> so everyone in Hamilton County, Brainerd, what's, Red Bank, what's going on? <laughs> Howard, Tyner, <laughs> CD. <laughs> okay, so give us a little background about what was it like for you growing up in Chattanooga? Well, growing up in Chattanooga, I mean, uh, I moved some uh, different places. I started out on, which nobody would really know, it's like over in the uh, Dalewood area or Dogwood area, but then also transitioned to the Brainerd area. And so mm -hmm. growing up, um, I mean, I, I started out when I was uh, at Henry L. Barger. That was the first time I ever met uh, a black male teacher. And okay. so uh, my first time meeting that black male teacher, uh, Mr. McCray. And uh, he always provided those things for us, you know, for us to actually show our gifts and things of that nature. But started out um, uh, running track and, uh, and and being in uh, Brainerd High School and 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 learning. But one thing about Brainerd High School, it was a culture. It was like college, and you know, we were all like a family. Oh yeah, Brainerd High School is is like the number one school, and in, uh, in Chattanooga, all top. And so uh, running track and uh, modeling and uh, singing in the choir, as you said, I couldn't sing. And um, the shape, pause, wait a minute. Let's run it back. You model in high school? Yes, we semi professional model. We was the only modeling uh, like organization that was at Brainerd High School and everybody came to see us. And so I, I don't know if you remember Merrick around. Yes. OK, I worked in Merrick around. So. The clothes from Merrick around was for our fashion show. And if anybody's out there that's from Chattanooga, they know about the brain of team review. Okay. See, kids don't know about that era. That was like the era of like wet seal. Yes. The gap. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The gap, wet seal. Uh, what Five, was it? seven, Oscar nine. nine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Charlie Roos when it was popping, you know. Right. Was, when the heel didn't break. Yeah. The, and see, if you, if you were um, a little... I won't say bougie, but you you thought you were all that. You might go to Amber Crombie. So right. that, era. that was that era. Okay. Amber Crombie. <laughs> Crombie and Finch. Okay, right. so Brandon was the high school to go to. Um, so what was your high school years like? Did you were you like a straight A student? Did you get in trouble? Like what was that about? Well, I'll tell you, uh, before I got to Brainerd, I actually um I actually went to juvenile uh at the age of 14. And so when I went to juvenile and I had to come to Brainerd and uh, actually uh, work out my my work hours at Brainerd. And so coming to Brainerd, no, I wasn't a straight A student. Actually, um, coming to Brainerd, I ended up getting uh, or leaving Brainerd with a 1.5. And so, uh, yeah, I, I graduated with a 1.5. A lot of wait, my wait, 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 wait. So you went to Brainerd. Yes. So you went to juvenile first and went to Brainerd, or did you go to Brainerd and then go to juvenile? I went to juvenile, and then when I I what I did is I went to juvenile, and then I got out. Of, I was on probation, had an opportunity uh, to get back in track, and so it was summer track. Summer track is what really got me through, and so when I got into track, I met uh, I got back in in uh, connection with Miss Sparns, Mary Sparns, who was my coach. Right. So got in the track. And and then I uh, she mapped out my whole entire school year from ninth grade to senior of what grades I needed to make. Now, okay. but you still graduated with the with a one point five GPA. Yes, I graduated with a one point five. So how That's did you my, get into MTSU? Well, actually, I I transitioned. I went to uh, I set out for two years, and so oh. I went to Chattanooga State. Okay. 
And so I went to Chattanooga State for a year, and then I transitioned to Barber Scotia College, where Miss Mary Sparns drove me to. So I went to Barber Scotia College in North Carolina. I went there for a year. Wait a minute. Is that in Charlotte? Yes, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Wow. Okay. <laughs> life, is, yeah. life is such a full circle. Keep going. Right. And so HB, I went there. That was my first HBCU. And I just had, uh, my son was just born. And so that was a tough struggle for me to actually leave the city and actually go to school. And I made the decision that I thought it would be better. And I still, I had to work two jobs and have a track scholarship while I was there at Barbara Scotia College. And then I transferred to MTSU. Yeah, I was at your probate. Y'all came out in the limo? Yes, ma'am. On the yard. Yes, ma'am. Showing yes. all the way out. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. So you did track. I didn't do basketball. I wanted to do basketball, but I'm short. I'm only like five foot four and a half. And me and the goal was like giving like distance. So that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, it was giving distance. So that didn't work out for me. So you did track. Yes. Um, you graduate from MTSU. When did you feel like, okay, I'm ready to get into education field? Or was there other things going on before that even happened? Well, when I graduated from uh, undergrad at MTSU, I went into working for the Department of Children's Services. So I became a child protective service investigator and then wow. tra transitioned into being a uh, uh, juvenile uh, juvenile uh, liaison, a court liaison. I never knew that. Okay, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I became a court liaison, and then after that, I transitioned into working at uh, Monroe Harding, which is a group home. Mm -hmm. And so I became a chaplain, and I became a residential coordinator, residential counselor. And so all through that, I've been working with, with youth for over 20 years. Okay. So then you graduate from MTSU. Where were you at that time? I graduated from MTSU. I was living in Nashville, working for the Department of Children's Services. Uh, then I tried my, my shot at criminal justice for my master's mm -hmm. and then, uh, that got paused. And then, so I went on to divinity and that got stopped. And so then I went to Cumberland university where I ended up getting my master's in public service management. Okay. Okay. So as far as doing school, having KJ going through life, because when I remember seeing you on campus, and I think we had talked about this before, to me, you were always like in another space or another place. Like I would see you on the yard. Mm -hmm. I was with my source, you know, whatever, whatever. But I would just see you. We might speak or whatever, but I just remember seeing you. But sometimes you were like on the go. I just remember just seeing you like in passing. You may have hung around the tree. Shout mm -hmm. out to the tree, RP. Right, right, tree right. To the yard. If you know, you know. You went to MTSU, you know what I'm talking about. But right. then you were just be gone so what was going on at that time well at that time i was uh i was taking care of my son you know and i was also working like still working two jobs i had mm -hmm. i had stopped running track and my, i was focused and then with the understanding that i was still taking care of my mom my brother had passed uh who i was taking care of when i was in high school that uh he had uh contracted hiv and then to full-blown aids and passed when he was 27. oh wow and so I was taking care of my brother and I was taking care of my mother when I was in school. So I was traveling back and forth from Chattanooga to right. Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that my mom was good. And she had, she was, uh, had dialysis, she was on dialysis and had lupus. Oh, wow. Yes. So where, how, I know that could have been, a, that was a lot of pressure. So where did that have you emotionally, like, you know, trying to focus while all that was going on at the same time? Well, uh, Mentally, I mean, I had to be in a different space. I mean, I had to grow up real quick. So I had to uh, push my feelings aside. I had to make sure that, you know, uh, my son was good and his emotions not being with his dad. And so I just really had to focus on getting out of school and making a better life for myself and my son. Okay. You just dropped a load on this. Like, that's a lot. Because I know when I was in college, I'm not even gonna lie. I joined a sorority. <laughs> right, right. Class, then, my homework was out. then I was in the sorority, and we're gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Had a good time. <laughs> we'll do it again, sure would. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Shouts out, Sim Gamero. Yes, moving right along. We're not going down that rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to when you were talking about when you were in juvenile, do you remember why you got in trouble or? 
what caused you to go down that path during your time in high school? Well, actually, my brother was doing some of the same things, you know, and uh, and so I said, well, hey, he keeps getting away with it. And so I was like, well, let me try it. And so when I did, it was all getting the attention. My mom was working two jobs. Uh, my dad had another family, you know, with my brothers and my sisters. And so I was out there to fend for myself. And so ended up getting caught. But actually, the, the interesting thing is that I got caught on purpose because I knew that I had to stop. I needed to stop. And so when the police came, I didn't run. So when I went to juvenile, I was sitting in juvenile with all my friends. Everybody was in there that got caught. And so God came to me during that time and he said, I show, I'm going to show you the way that you're going. And I'm going to show you the way that I want you to go. And I had to make a decision and I, and I went the way that God wanted me to go. And when I got out, I got baptized by my football coach, uh, Lerone Jennings, coach Lerone Jennings at the time. And I was in a fellowship of Christian athletes. And so as, as I was out of getting out of those situations, I was putting myself in, in, in different organizations so that I can stay busy and so I can stay out of trouble. So I was in a fellowship of Christian athletes. I was modeling and I was in the choir. You know, I was running track. I played football. I ran cross country. And so I was making sure that I filled my schedule. And then nobody ever knew that I was taking care of my brother and my mother. Nobody. I got friends to this day that they thought, they said, why you didn't tell me? I said, what, what could you have done? You know, I'm sitting here thinking about what you said. And um, what's so crazy is when I got to M10 shoe, I had already like backslid out of the church and stuff. And I was just doing what I wanted to do. And I remember one particular time, me and some sores, we, went, we went to a party somewhere. It was in Nashville. I can't, I think it was Vanderbilt tissue home. It was somebody's homecoming. Mm -hmm. And I was in the club and I was drinking, you know, but it was like, I could hear God talking to me as clear as day. Like, you know, you don't have any business in here. And it was like, even though I had alcohol in my system, it was like, it killed my whole buzz. And I remember just standing there like in a daze and I could hear God talking to me in the club. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, and when my source was like, Camille, like, come on, it's time to stroll. And I snapped out of it. But it was like I was dancing, but my mind was thinking about what I just heard. It was like the weirdest experience. Yeah. He and it's like you know, sometimes you can be in a situation like, man, I'm not trying to do God right now. I just want to do me, you know. But it was like even in that, he was like, no. <laughs> like, no, you're not doing that. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an out of body experience. Yeah. It was crazy. So I, I, I can relate to that. Um, so here you are. Um, you're now when well, you went from having a 1.5 GPA in high school to getting your master's degree to now you're a doctoral candidate at Trevecca University, correct? That's correct. Okay. And what is your concentration or your studies in for that? It is in leadership and uh, professional practice. Okay. And since then, you're working with uh, Metro National Nashville Public Schools, correct? Yes, I'm a restorative practice coach right now. Actually, uh, formerly a family involvement specialist for the district. Okay, and then what does that really entail for those that may not know? For a restorative practice coach, uh, I'm the person that's in the school that uh, try to help create the culture uh, for our students so that uh, they can have a place or a safe place to come. And uh, we, we talk through uh, different situations uh, and maybe incidents that may have taken place. It may be they come in and they're rattled and, and it may be something that uh, we don't know, but they trust me enough to bring those things to me and we can actually come up with some solution. It could be something simple as them being hungry or it could be something so simple where it happened over the break. Like right now, we just got off a break and their their parents, you know, hasn't been there or, you know, uh, they're, they're, somebody may have passed and that was close to them. And so we don't we can't read their minds, but they're able to come and we're able to kind of talk through those things and, and communicate on that level. Okay. So now that you are um, in the school system, as far as with uh, Metro National Public Schools, I know you see a lot, particularly since the pandemic, um, as far as what's been going on, what are some of the things you have seen or have noticed in the transition for the kids uh, in the school system as far as their adjustment? 
I would say that uh, the kids uh, in that transition, as far as wanting to 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 work more, they don't they don't have the want to work as much. And I would say that uh, they need more love and more hugs. And now, you know, we can't touch, we really can't touch students or you really can't hug them and give them that support that they really need. And so we have to find out a different way of doing that. But the mental health piece is so critical right now with our students. Uh, there's a lot of students that are taking on so much uh, adult issues and they don't know how to handle it. They don't know where to put it. And so we as teachers end up being the counselor, we end up being the mother, we end up being, you know, we're putting shoes, we're putting uh, underwear, we're doing, we're, we're doing so much to try to make sure kids, you know, are taken care of. And it's not to discount what the parents are doing, but it's a lot that parents are dealing with, whether they're losing their job, they're losing their home. A uh, teacher just came to me today and said, hey, I need your help to get this person a home because they're about to lose their home. Wow. And and this is where I want to get to the meat of the conversation, because traditionally there have been more women in the classroom. But I think it's also more important that we have a male presence in the classroom. Um, and the reason why we need to have this conversation is because, um, to me, I think there's a different tone that comes into the room when a man shows up. And it's not about being sexist. It's just a real reality. Kids respond to male presence in a different way than they would with a woman. Um, and even like right now, uh, Mr. Uh, Rural Arrington, he's on watching right now. He was one of my favorite high school teachers in high school. And uh, he always had this saying before a test, he would say, let's make A's. And he always brought this charisma uh, to the classroom. And you could have like a boring teacher before, after, but all the kids, we always were so excited because we knew Mr. Arrington's class. He did, we had the textbooks, but he didn't just stick to the book. We could, if we read a book, and we could talk about it. He was open to it. He was always open to what we had to say. It wasn't just about him giving the curriculum, but mm -hmm. just our views on it. And he, and, and as far as a few other educators I had throughout my life, but he's one of those key educators I had as a child that really gave me a love for learning. And I kind of got addicted to it. <laughs> People are like, you're in school for what now? But I just, <laughs> it's just, he was just in a phenomenal, charismatic, energetic teacher. And I think we have men in the classroom that come into the spaces and they show a love and a passion for what they do and they um, show that they really care about what you have to say as a child, it really means so much. So then what going on to the next question, Kevin, what do you see on a daily on a daily basis that parents may not be aware of in the classroom or just as you're walking the halls with your students? Well, I'll say first, when I start off, uh, I start off at the bus duty. So I'm giving high fives to kids when they're coming off. So it may be incidents or something that may have taken place at the bus stop. Mm -hmm. uh, or like a, I, I remember a student was so upset that she didn't think her mother told she's not getting them for Christmas. Oh, and, I said, and I told her, I said, let's not worry about that right now. You know, and I don't and if you need a break or you need to come, we need to just chill. Let's let's get through the day, you know. And so I let her teacher know. But I, I, I know coming into the room, I mean, a lot of kids, uh, I try to create things where uh, it identifies, you know, me. As, as this person who's not just a cool, you know, uh, guy, but I, they know I mean business. And so when they come in, they feel like a father, that, that a fatherly person coming in. They know I care about them, but they also know I'm not going to help them fail. And so whether it be if they need to come do their work in my office or whether they need to do a walk and talk or whether they, you know, uh, like we just had a situation where, and just be honest, a kid, he eloped. And when I say eloped, he, he took off. He was going home. You know, he, he just that's what his mind did. And what I and, and I went and got him. But if wait, 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 you went home and got him. No, I went and got him. He was running home. I went and got him. Yeah. And so and brought him back to the school. But what I'm saying is, if he didn't see my face, he might have not come. So a lot of kids. They come and they tell me, I missed you. Because a lot of kids, they want to stay at the school. A lot of kids, when we're out, they want to be in the school. And, you know, and they enjoy learning. And so that's what a lot of kids feel that warmth. They feel that support. Uh, they, they they don't, in, a, in the lunchroom today, they sing in Taki songs. You know, I, you know, I don't eat Takis and I tell them I don't like Takis, but I say it's a no Taki zone. 
and they'd be like, "It's a talkie zone," you know. So wait a minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is a talkie? A talkie is that that chip that's like got heavy like flavor on it, and it's hot. It's I think it's like hot. It's not. It don't have a taste to it to me. But kids love them. But but I'm cre- I'm I'm stepping into their their generation of of what they love. But I'm I'm playing with that, and so kids really pick up on that. And so when I walk in a classroom, teachers like, uh-uh, you gotta go in my room because you're gonna get them started. So, you know, it's just those fun things. And like, if I go into a classroom, I've been having to go in there and teach, and I'm and I'm not a licensed teacher, so I had to go in and teach. I I can teach. I can run a class. That's no problem. So they they I create things. I do it differently. I changed the whole aspect, the whole culture of the class and kids are being able to help each other. They're being able to answer questions because I'm transparent in my in my way of teaching. OK, so what has been one of the greatest hurdles or the hardest things you've seen from a male perspective in the classroom that maybe having to respond to a situation or even an interaction with a student? One of the toughest things uh I would say where um, our young ladies. Um, well, how they, so? Uh, well, well, young ladies uh, that they're they're fighting so much. I mean, they're, and and thing about it is, they just want somebody to just listen to them, you know, and and they're fighting and they're fighting each other. On, I mean, it's petty stuff. I mean, it's so it's so petty. And so what I'm saying is that they're they're fighting at the bus stop, they're fighting uh, in the classroom. And once you really get to the bottom of why you're really fighting, it has nothing to do with the the other person, and it's internally. And so when we deal with those things that are internal, and we talk those things out, because these kids that I work with, they I've been with them for almost four years now. So I knew them when they was younger, and so I'm able to process with them and their parents. Like their parents called me Mr. McKenzie, uh, you know, such, 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 such. I mean, you know, when you start knowing kids' nicknames, oh, you, have, right. you have a better relationship. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Like mom be like, so uh, Vanilla was like, I'd be like, yeah, Vanilla was, I, I'm sorry, Mr. McKenzie, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so, yeah, so just really uh, trying to help them because a lot of them uh, don't have fathers, you know? And so uh, one Two twins, they they say you smell like my dad. I say, yes. how your dad got all the colognes I have, <laughs> you know. But it's just it's so it's so much fun. So you touched on something as far as how little girls respond to you in the school system because uh, some of them may not have fathers. How hard can that be as far as with communicating with boys or girls in the classroom if they've never really heard a male voice in a place of authority before? Well, I'll give you an example uh, where it's a young lady. Uh, she's of another culture, and I think this—I I think this is different from what you're saying. But she uh, she couldn't stand my voice. What do and you she, mean she couldn't stand your voice? Well, she because I would if I would tell people, you know, I need you to sit down, I need you to, you know, be quiet in the cafeteria. It would be elevated. But what it did, it remind her of her father in the house. And I said, well, why do, why do you always avoid me? She said, because I can't stand your voice. And so right then I turned, I didn't say anything. I wrote my my answer and I wrote the question. And then she held out her hand and shook my hand only because she didn't want, she, it reminded her of the abuse. Oh, it was an emotional trigger. Yes. Wow. And so That's- you have to be sensitive as a male to those things that are going on in school because a lot of you some people would avoid it and be like hey whatever you'll get over it no this is somebody who is very sensitive and needs a different way of communicating so that she can actually feel safe in this space so okay that that kind of opened another door for questioning so when you have kids like that that come into the classroom or or into your school um that have adverse situations at home that impacts communication that can impact behavior that impacts learning so how do you kind of maneuver through those environments or those situations with students 
you know, if they've never encountered a male or even feeling threatened or triggered by a male presence in the classroom? I, I believe uh, you have to read the room. And, and so I think I think it's very important for you to understand that we can't do this work by ourselves. So you got to either get another, a, a, a lady, a young, another another lady or a peer, one of the peers were in the room with you. Because sometimes you don't need to say anything as a male. Sometimes you really just need to listen. And also, when if you have a, a, a young lady or a counselor or a teacher that can come in, we do this this thing where we 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 kind of piggyback off each other. And we've been doing it for such a long, a long time in, in the school district where we're able to understand when we need to say something, when we don't. And we've been able to help kids because sometimes kids want to hear from you and sometimes they don't. But sometimes kids just want to be heard. And student voice is so important right now. Students, students want to be heard and because they don't get to talk at home. Mm -hmm. So um, someone uh, brought up a, a comment in the questions. We are here live. And for those that are just tuning in, thank you so much. Um, my name is Camille Essek. This is the host of the Speaker Podcast, the podcast where innovators and creators connect. I'm here with Kevin McKenzie, and we are having a discussion about male presence in the classroom and, um, and educational spaces. So one of the viewers, I brought up the point, Kevin, they said our students need so much support outside of the educational realm. So I think, well, I will say this. I know I've heard many parents, they just want to place the responsibility just on the teacher alone. And today's educators, they're not just the teacher. They are the psychiatrist. They are the social worker. They are the, the chaplain. They are so many other things that they have to get through before they can even start educating the student. So can you kind of touch on Kevin or unpack the importance of having parental support of educators outside of the classroom, they're working with the teacher and um, you, you hear stories about parents coming up to the school and why did my parent, why did my child get a C and what's going on and don't say anything to my child. But can you kind of touch on how it's important for parents to reinforce and assist the the teachers in the classroom once they leave the school setting? I would say it's it's very important. I mean, it's uh, because a lot of the, the students, they end up feeling like if, if their parent is against the teacher, then they can be against the teacher. They're only acting out or doing what they see. So it's so important for parents to support uh, what teachers are doing, but communication is key. They have to make sure that they're staying in communication. They have class uh, class dojo. Uh, they have the Google uh, phones where you can keep in contact. Uh, it's communication, communication, communication. Because you can miscommunicate and miss the mark, and the only person that's going to suffer is that student. Because we have the student as educators most of the day. So it's so important whether you uh, you support the student and the classroom so that everybody can be on the same page. And I think the problem can arise too, where some parents may have had bad experiences themselves growing up through their educational experience. And so I believe that it's very important for us to bring that parent along to let them know it's not the same situation. Mm -hmm. And we have to really school them and educate them on the importance, it, whether it's an IEP, you know, whether it's a S team situation, or whether it's a, a or whether it's a crisis, we have to make sure that we educate our, our parents and bring them along with us. And I had and I've done it before where I told this parent, I said, if you don't tell me what's going on, they're gonna put your child on paper and it's gonna follow him the rest of his life. I need to know what's going on, not to be in your business, but I need to know so I can better serve your student while they're here with me. So okay. Because that kind of leads into the whole um, a prison to pipeline conversation. Because, and I hate to say it, uh, there are things that happen systemically, uh, particularly within um, the years of junior high to high school, that can change um, the path of a student where they don't even touch foot on the college campus just because they're just navigating um, some hiccups throughout their preteen and teen years. Mm -hmm. So, how can uh, uh, educators? recognize, okay, this kid is not bad. Maybe there's something going on at home that we can work with a parent to get this kid on the right track. Just like when you shared at the beginning of this episode, like you were in high school, you went to juvenile, you graduated with a 1.5. However, there was someone 
that saw something stuff in and now you're wrapping up your PhD. So how can parents and students recognize those things? So if they see a pattern, they kind of stop it before it goes into the deep end. Well, <clears throat> it still goes with communication, but uh, they have so many tests that's going on, but social and emotional learning, uh, the, 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 the whole piece of really recognizing and really addressing. So making sure that our, our teachers are educated in SEL, which is social and emotional learning, making sure that our teachers are, are, are not bringing their own stuff to the classroom because you can actually void out helping a student because you, you're dealing with your own person. You're taking it personal when a kid acts up. And I think that that's so important for us to really be a visual for our students and understand it's not about you. You're there to serve. And, and, and the student, they're just only doing what they, what they see. Now, there are some students that do get a little bit to the left, but you cannot take it personal as an adult. And I think that's something that an adult teacher has to work on for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's why mental health is so important. That's why uh, educating yourself and going through different trainings is so important for you to get those things so that you can better serve those students and their family. Yeah. So what are schools doing now within education systems to implement some form of mental health for not only the students, but for the educators and staff as well? If, if there is something that is available that there are putting in the school. Well, I will say that um, with with the students, I know that with uh, we have so many different things as positive reinforcement. Uh, we have uh, 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 different opportunities for kids to get uh, pred. It's called pride pride points, mm -hmm. and so you know they can actually participate in in, in things you know and, and do the right thing and and, and make them. Uh, aware of, of some of the great things that, that, that can happen. But are they going to put like actual therapy and not a school counselor, yeah. counselor but like an actual therapist for educators and students um, separate so that way they can freely ex express what they're going through without fear of backlash or their business getting uh, exposed? Well, the interesting thing is they, they, <laughs> they come to me then. So uh, as a restorative practice, the kids actually, if there's something that's going on, they come to me and they ask, I'm not a, I'm not a licensed therapist, but between me, the counselor and, and uh, possibly, you know, our school psychologist, that's how we're able to, to work with those students. But I know that uh, Dr. Uh, Desiree Kelly, she has come to our school and she is uh, a big proponent, proponent of mental health. She is an expert in mental health. And so she's come and worked with our students and she has been uh, suggesting to work with our teachers. So she has uh, these, these cards called support cards. And so it's amazing what she's doing and, and with the students in the classroom and the teachers. So it's just really us actually uh, participating in the mental health uh, uh, resources that are provided for us. Okay, and then one final question, what are educators and school systems doing to educate or expose teachers to various cultures or communities that way kids are not being labeled or slandered or treated a certain way because that teacher may not be familiar with that kid's culture or background or environment and they can better communicate with that child without them being accused of presenting as aggressive or getting an attitude but not understanding kind of the backstory of that child or students that may be similar to that child as far as um, discrimination in the classroom? Every day is case by case, but since we, uh, since the uh, pandemic, I don't think that a lot of that has taken place as mm -hmm. far as the educating of different cultures and things of that nature. I do know when we did Parent University uh, that was uh, done about four years ago, that we would uh, have different uh, uh, cultural experience and opportunities you know, even even with the schools, they would have culture night, okay. you know, and we used to do that. And I had 17 schools that I was working with. And so you had different uh, foods, you had different uh, artifacts, you had different things that exposed families and parents and kids and teachers to the different cultures that are in the schools. We have over 23 different languages that's being spoken in our school. Wow. And so you only you get it's like a case by case. 
So you may find out that like with women that are of the Islamic faith, me as a male, I approach the man and not the the lady. She, she doesn't reach her hand out. You know, there's so many things that you learn. Having cultural awareness. Yes. Okay. Wow. So I guess um, my next question is, well, what is next for you? What, what do you have next going on? What's on the horizon for you next? Graduation. Uh, <laughs> my whole thing is about graduating right now uh, with my doctorate and uh, really uh, allowing that to fuel uh, my uh, nonprofit, and, which is Dope Hope, and uh, working on mentor training, uh, educational consulting, and uh, really uh, motivating and student life coaching. And so that's what I'm really looking at, I'm looking forward. Uh, I'm working with Octane, uh, who is really uh, helping me to strategize and and, and, and build uh, my, my opportunity to do podcasts and be great like what you're doing right now. And so that's what I'm looking at, uh, being able to serve and, and help the world uh, just like you're doing. Well, thank you. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time uh, to join me here. And you'll be here next week. We're going to do a, a fatherhood panel. That's going to be a great conversation. That, that will be next Tuesday at 730 Eastern Standard Time here on the Speaker Podcast. And if you would like to stay in the loop, go to my website at the Speaker Podcast and subscribe. So um, we're going to go ahead and say, uh, Dr. McKenzie, thank you for joining us here on the Speaker <laughs> Podcast. And we look forward to having you on again. And where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can find me at uh, Instagram on uh, The Kevin McKenzie Show, or you can find me at uh, KD McKenzie Senior uh, Instagram. Also, you can find me at Kevin D McKenzie uh, on fa uh, Facebook. Awesome. Well, I hope everyone got something uh, from this conversation tonight. I do want to thank you for joining us. This is Camille Essick. I'm host of the Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast where innovators and creators can connect. Lord, these braces are wearing me out. Jesus. <laughs> and we'll see y'all next week. Thanks. Peace. Chemistry Room Fragrances is the perfect addition when elevating the vibe of any space. Whether if it's your home, car, or office, and something needs a quick refresh, our room fragrances provide that beautiful burst of fragrance with just one quick mist. Shop now at www.chemistryroomfragrances.com and be sure to follow us on Instagram at Chemistry Room Fragrances. Chemistry Room Fragrances. Mmm, smells so good. <laughs>